Hello. Passionate about sustainability, energy, and climate? You're in the right place. Welcome to Energetic. I'm Maureen Cornelis, and together we will engage with people who dedicate their lives to climate justice and making a just energy transition happen. They may be activists, scientists, policymakers, or other enthusiasts, just like you. Let the life stories and insights inspire you to build a better future for people and the planet. Meet Jan Mohawad, uh, seasoned media and communication virtuoso with a passion for shaping global energy narratives. With other, over 20 years in the field, Jed has worn many hats, from journalist to digital strategist and from policy advisor to global communicator. As the driving force behind the energy energy The International Energy Agency communication from 2016 to 2023, Jed was more than just a spokesperson. He was a digital pioneer steering the IEA's digital transformation and amplifying its voice on critical issues like climate change, energy security, and clean energy transitions. Under his leadership, the IEA didn't just talk, it engaged, partnering with tech giants like Google and YouTube to broaden its reach. Before his tenure at the IEA, Jed was the global energy correspondent for the New York Times, where he dissected complex topics like OPEC dynamics and climate policy, making them accessible to the public. Born in Beirut and a French national, his multicultural background enriches his global perspective. Jeld, welcome to Energetic. Thank you. It's really great to be with you on the show, Marie. Thank you so much, Jed. So, Jed, what inspired you to dedicate your life and your career to climate communication and energy policy? Is it because of something you studied or witnessed personally? Not so much. I think it was a bit of an accident of of history, of my professional kind of pathways, as you mentioned in your very flattering introduction. I started as a journalist and very quickly started covering business topics. And within those topics, uh, the world of energy. And the world of energy very, very quickly fascinated me and drew me in because you could find in energy economics, obviously, trade issues, issues about sustainability, very obviously, and politics and geopolitics. So from there, and this was 20 years ago, uh, the articulation, the, the crux between energy and climate wasn't as articulated as it is today in energy coverage, but that got me into uh, thinking and writing about the footprint of the energy, first on an, of the energy industry on an environmental level, but then also the impact it has on the climate. And and from there, I think it was kind of a straight line. And today I still consider it is one of the most important topics and certainly climate change is a topic that affects us all beyond everything and within everything that we do. And And so this is where I'm kind of, I am right now. Well, so 20 years ago, when there was basically no connection in anybody's mind between energy and climate or Nobody was really talking about climate crisis 20 years ago or only maybe in some small circles. You were part of the, let's say, pioneers who brought those topics together, right? Well, I don't think I was one of those pioneers really? because I think these were topics uh, that were covered separately. And there was an understanding that human made greenhouse gases or at least greenhouse gases coming from the combustion of fossil fuels were contributing to warming of the planet. This was articulated many, many decades ago. Uh, this is something that energy companies knew about. But I think in the mainstream press coverage, and even in how newsrooms were organized, you had an environmental desk that covered the environment at the time, which has turned into a kind of a climate desk. And then you had the business desks covering energy. And there was very little kind of cooperation. And that evolved. And I was there... When I was working at the New York Times, we merged the coverage and I was certainly very much in favor of having this understanding of the impact of the energy industry on the planet, but definitely on, on climate and, and vice versa. And I think this is where things have very, very much evolved to the point where today it's essentially the same kind of coverage. Absolutely. And it is also extremely visible with uh, the way the International Energy Agency, where you served for many years, 
shifted its strategy from being kind of a big oil club to quite a leading advocate in uh, for clean energy, for environmental sustainability of the energy sector as well. So can you, you, you were quite instrumental in shaping this, this shift. So can you share some, yeah, of the ane anecdotes or something that, that really happened and made that transformation happen within the, the International en Energy Agency, IEA? Yeah. So the IA, as you mentioned, was very much associated with the energy industry, particularly the oil industry. And for reasons that are very obvious, it was created 50 years ago in 1974 after the first oil shock. And it was created to be the agency of energy security, particularly of oil security. So from its inception, the IEA had this mandate about oil supplies and oil security that has a mechanism whereby IEA members uh, work collectively to put oil on the market if there is a disruption. At the same time, it also had a mandate from its origin about conservation and energy efficiency. So there was always this sort of sense that energy is precious and needs to be conserved and not just as an energy security issue. Fast forward four decades, just as the energy sector has changed, the IEA changed. And I was very fortunate to join the agency when a new executive director started, Dr. Fatibiro, who basically made it his mandate to transform the agency into the leading voice for the clean energy transition. And that took a while, but the mission and the mandate was very, very strong from 2015 when, when he started, when I started. And I think it also reflects very much this sort of understanding from stakeholders that you know, we need to act quickly. The energy sector is responsible for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. If you solve the energy side of the equation, you're going a very, very long way in having a shot at meeting the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And so over the years, the IEA started putting together uh, various scenarios, including the most recent one, uh, which is a net zero pathway for the energy sector to get to to meet the Paris Agreement's goals of limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degree by the end of the century. So it, it really kind of showed the way for what the energy sector needs to do. And the issue here isn't energy. The issue, the problem is emissions. And so it's taken on its role of energy security agency and basically looked at the, um, at the picture and, and kind of outlined a pathway for how to get to net zero. So I, I was fortunate to be there from the start to the point where on both sides, both from the oil sector and the energy sector, and also from the, let's say, activist field, we're very much viewed as the agency that is kind of giving kind of the, the, the pathway for how to get to net zero. And that's been a very good change, I think, uh, over these seven years that I served there. And one of the really specific aspects of your job was to really make sure that the message get right and including also kind of break the communication, this very tough communication because climate change is tough uh, really. It can be also very disheartening and it's it's a lot of uh, injustices that go to the to the surface whenever you you look at, at the energy sector and at the climate situation in general. And one of really your main task was to make sure that the information became actually something digestible and something that people could could really take ownership of and really uh, act upon if needed. And that's real, really how good communication is done. It's really something, it's not only about spreading the, the message, but making sure people really take ownership of the message, right? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I don't think the world needs another 500 page report on what to do. Like we have a lot of those. Um, and I think a lot of the work that we have done in the comms team at the IEA was to move away from a very report centric approach where, you know, you write a piece of analysis, which is very important. You publish the report and you expect kind of the world to come and find it, buy it, read it, and really essentially turn this upside down to the point where and this was part of a digital strategy at the IEA where we really wanted to take the findings, take the analysis, take the key messages, take them out of the reports and really seed them in our digital ecosystem. So you mentioned some of the partnerships we've had with digital platforms, but before even getting there, 
to really kind of create new channels of engagement and communication. So from the website that we completely revamped to expanding our social channels, to creating a podcast, which not as successful as yours because after 10 episodes during COVID, we sort of slowed down on that, but uh, uh, it's something to kind of revive, to creating a YouTube channel to to serve as a engagement platform, Instagram, et cetera. So, so really use and leverage all of the the digital channels that we have to be able to spread the word and spread the message and and really keep an eye on impact and engagement of our audiences and finding different audiences in different ways and giving them the message in the way that they would consume it. So keep doing reports, obviously, but also find ways in visual ways and in video and in infographics to really kind of get the message out. And if I can touch on it very quickly, We also started working with platforms to essentially take the messages out of the IA platforms and seed them or share them in places that are not platforms owned by the agency. So we had a really successful ongoing partnership with Google to put some key information about the energy crisis, about currently heat pumps and other forms of clean energy on kind of Google search. We have another very successful partnership with Wikipedia that allows us to really put the latest analysis on that platform. We did a really kind of fun test idea, which I thought was really successful with the Financial Times, where we kind of co-created with them a an, a game called the Climate Game, which you can still find and Google it and play, which puts you in charge basically as the Minister of Future Generations for the World and kind of walks you through various decisions that you must take and to see if you can reach our climate goals and reach 1.5 uh, degrees. So very challenging game, uh, very hard to to reach, but possible, which is essentially the, the point of the scenario, that it'll be hard and challenging to get to net zero, but it's still possible. And so we really wanted to find the audience with our messages that are complicated, uh, but really simplify them and and find the audience where where they are. But for the example you shared with the Financial Times, it's still a very specific audience of people who are actually very well informed. Usually it's a very specific segment, let's say, of people who read them, international thought leaders somehow uh, and business leaders. So how would you make this kind of tools mainstream? Is it something that you you would like to see somewhere, someday, uh, some kind of actions like that? Because it's not only about the elites, it's also about us citizens as voters who can also elect the right people who will make the certain type of decisions or choose a certain business of a, another. What are your view on really, on let's say, mainstream communication about energy and climate? Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's a very good point you make. And yes, FT is not your standard sort of uh, general public kind of media. It, it was a trial. It was a test. Um, the the game itself was outside of the paywall, so anyone can play the game without having to subscribe to the FT. But indeed, it's it's a very specific audience. But they also, I think what's really interesting in this project, they used it as part of their engagement with schools and with universities and with students. So they also have a program to kind of educate kids on various topics, get them to read the Financial Times. And so they use the game as well as a as a, as a hook and an engagement tool for them. I think gaming in general offers really interesting possibilities for all kinds of communications on public service issues. I think the World Health Organization has made some really interesting forays into gaming and also partnering with different platforms to share some of their public health messages. It doesn't have to be a game about, let's take the WHO, it doesn't have to be a game about, can you find a vaccine for COVID? It can be seeding within a game, within an environment where a lot of kids are now kind of living a good chunk of their lives, messages or little nuggets or or clues or even side quests that kind of resonate with them and that uh, allow you to pass your message. I kind of feel like there's an opportunity here for our community, for those interested in climate and energy to kind of think through how do you, exactly to your point, uh, put across messages to the general public about what can be done. And I think this is sort of the main issue here is how do we engage 
with audiences, who has authority to engage, who can speak to them. And, and in here, in that sphere, I think we are not doing very well, frankly. I mean, let's, I'd, I'd rather focus on the opportunities, but we are failing in many ways in our job as communicators. And we can find a lot of excuses for that. We can talk about the fact that we are in a post-truth world, that our audiences are polarized, that the media landscape is fragmented, that trust in media, as in many institutions, is plummeting. And I have some kind of facts that I kind of spend a lot of time on to really think through what does that mean for us. And at the same time, this new ecosystem of platforms where, let's be very candid here, misinformation, fake news is rampant. I mean, if you look at Twitter these days, and we're taping this on the No Twitter Day for those who are abiding by it. So this is a day where in protest of Twitter's policies, you know, you should avoid the platform there is a comeback of climate change denialism, you know, denial of facts, hashtags like climate scam. And, and this is because the platform has kind of decided to take off all of the uh, barriers to fake news. And we can see the impact of that uh, very, very quickly since uh, it was taken over by a certain billionaire. Misleading advertisements on Facebook, that exists. And Facebook is still a leading engagement platform for a lot of people. TikTok, which is you know, some countries it's banned, uh, it's owned, you know, by Chinese entities. TikTok, no, nevertheless, reaches something like 40% of 18 to 24 year olds. And if you've ever been on TikTok, within four or five videos, the platform takes you down specific alleys. The algorithm shows you content that you've already liked. And so very quickly, you can end up in a very dark and, and bad place, not just for climate, uh, by the way. And that's important because 20% of these 18 to 24 year olds find their news on TikTok. They don't go to the traditional media anymore. They go to the platform for news. It becomes a search engine and a source of news. So if fake news is rampant there. That's what they're getting. So we should definitely broadcast this podcast on, on TikTok, right? <laughs> well, so we should. And the question is, will it get any attention? And I think that's kind of the issue is that even if you're trying, if you are late to the game, then you won't have a big shot at, at being surfaced by the algorithm. So, you know, it's, it's something that content creators, activists, policymakers, I mean, people really should be aware of very, very strongly. And then the final point, and we can kind of, kind of dissect all of these issues. We also live in a world of, I mean, this is no kind of big shock of multiple crises that are competing for our attention. And in this context, the climate crisis important as it is. And it is, what's the other word for vital? It's essential for the survival of our, our species on the planet. Even if people recognize and constantly, you can see in polls, particularly done by the World Economic Forum and others, when they're asking, what are the main crises that you see on the long-term horizon? Climate and environmental uh, issues are top of mind. But when you ask them, what is the most pressing crisis? These generally tend to kind of fall down the scale. We're talking at a time of crisis in the Middle East. Last year was inflation, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Before that, it was COVID. I mean, you have all of these issues that keep crowding out, uh, not just in the policy sphere, understandably, but also in the public attention sphere, the climate crisis. And it becomes really, really hard to kind of compete with that. Yeah, it's hard and it's overwhelming as well. So people get choosy about the information they, they receive and where they get the information as well because of this, this kind of um, balloon information system, really. So as you said, uh, it's get with social medias and platforms, maybe you get there to get an entertained and uh, maybe to to get um, yeah fresh, different views on things and get to, um, a lighter part of, of your day, let's say, but then if you don't pay attention, maybe you get fed with um, yeah, fake news or we can even say some. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of someone was, I read this news, uh, this article recently, someone was calling it the scrolling, scanning and swiping economy, as opposed to, you know, the time that you have to take to reflect to read a book, for instance, I don't know when the last time you finished a book, but for me, it's becoming harder and harder to actually finish a book because my attention has, the neurons in my brain, I think, have been rewired to seek instant gratification, 
and I don't have the attention of, it's hard at least, of finishing 200 page books. I'd ra much rather look at a 15 second video. Now imagine what that means for a whole population. I was born before the internet, but imagine for a whole population whose life is always been in this digital ecosystem in the last 20, 25 years. So I'm, I'm not sure what kind of we are seeing there. So this is kind of all for the negative side. I think it does give us as creators of content, but also as communicators, but also as activists, but also as people who are engaged in this policy issues, it does kind of question us and gives us also opportunities to communicate, I think, a bit differently. And this is what I think we need to spend a, a bit of time thinking about. I'm not sure anyone has really cracked it yet. And there are some really interesting examples out there of people who are doing really good work as a international institution, you know, it's maybe more difficult, uh, but I think we're all kind of need to move in that direction because we need to be out there convincing audiences, the public citizens about, you know, what needs to be done, giving them good arguments and encouraging them to then follow through and supporting proper public policy. I think that's the point of our engagement and the point of the impact we need to have in society. Yeah, it goes back to this, the fact that the societies are becoming really incredibly polarized with the, as you said, some, some kind of fake news circulating among certain circles, whereas other, where let's say science will prevail, are circles where they don't even, they, they can't even fathom that people don't, is not interested in some kind of topics. So it's really about kind of this bias, the this kind of expert bias that, that international organizations or scientific organizations, let's say scientists in general, have to, to break to make sure that their message gets received by, by more people in a way that is more genuine and more acceptable as well. And uh, that was also the purpose of, of this podcast when I started it really to, to make sure that the people who actually have ideas and think about that uh, get get their voice heard somehow and and for it to be a platform where you can find some really interesting content and resource to 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 build on and kind of think and uh, getting beyond the news because yes of course podcast and is a show it's it's something that is deeply ingrained in in the the idea of of the news but at the same time you can listen to an episode recorded two years two years ago and it's I hope it's still relevant, but we are recording now episode 41. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, a long run already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're completely spot on on this and, and really congratulations for the long run of the podcast. I think podcasts as a form is one of these sort of surprisingly resilient channels because uh, there's a very low barrier to sort of engaging with a podcast. You can do it while walking, shopping, cooking, you know, exercising or whatever. Um, and it allows you, particularly in, in your format, you know, when you have a bit of time to actually kind of have it back and forth. I, I just wanted to go back a little bit on this issue of trust and who's trusted to talk about these topics. And so I want to go back to this issue that you mentioned, which is kind of the trust in who speaks, who has authority to speak and, and the trust in science. There's a poll that Pew Research in the U.S. does every year, always asking the same questions about, you know, trust in institutions. And across the board, you see a incredible decline in trust in all institutions in the United States. I think it's true in, obviously, in other countries, but the data here is for the U.S. You know, elected officials, religious leaders, Congress, journalists have all seen the level of trust decline and the reasons are kind of long and historic. The one category that actually sees robust trust and even some increases are scientists. So there is still a trust in science, even though we have seen a bit of erosion after the COVID years when they were kind of criticized. But, you know, I don't know how to say this diplomatically. I'm not sure that sort of science communications is kind of always hitting the mark. In fact, it's sometimes quite poor or bad, or dismal. And I think a lot more could be done to kind of work with scientists. And, I, you know, the work that they do is indeed remarkable to kind of tell a story about the findings. And I think here, you know, as, as kind of communicators, 
the issue of telling a story, telling the reason behind the story, giving the facts to the public, helping kind of translate sometimes really jargon into something that is accessible to the public remains of critical importance. Because otherwise, we are left with, I'm not sure who has authority to speak. Uh, there's one example I kind of love to hate or hate to love, which is a recent editorial in The Guardian. And The Guardian, by the way, has an ethical chart about climate and news and what they can report and, and has done a lot in that respect. So this is not about that. But they had opened up their opinion page to Mr. Bean. And Mr. Bean... Yeah, I remember <laughs> it. I remember right. it. Yeah. How could you forget? And so Rowan Atkinson, who's an actor and a comedian, is how he was described in the bio at the bottom of this article. Yeah, uh, was, I honestly thought it was a hoax. Yeah. Yeah. Well, didn't we all? Yeah. Or a joke. But it wasn't a joke. It was, you know, this comedian. Just a side note, I want to put the link to, to, this, uh, to this terrible... Well, I mean, you could put it because basically for the, for, for the audience who hasn't seen it, this was basically, he was basically came, coming out and saying that he thought he was an early adopter of EVs, but he was profoundly disillusioned by EVs. Electric vehicles, yeah. Yeah, electric vehicles, doesn't believe the hype in it, and kind of goes on to list some patently false facts about electric vehicles and how essentially over the life of an, e of an electric vehicle, the carbon footprint, the environmental impact is worse than a internal combustion car, which is wrong and wrong and wrong. And so... You can point to the link because The Guardian did correct the article and did point out to the fallacies in the article and, if, and ended up opening up its opinion page to a couple of contributors who wrote the counter argument. But I think here, I mean, there's no two sides to it. There's a right side and the wrong side. And I, don't, I think this was a case of being very, uh, offering a big disservice to the public. But the point I take from this episode was really the question of who do we want to listen to and trust, again, when trying to figure out, because I think the, the public wants to know, you know, who do we trust when we want to figure out what are the facts about the transition? And what I feel or see is that, well, there are two things happening for the public within that. Either is disengaged, and there is a level of disengagement, or kind of like climate fatigue, wants to know if what are the actions that they can be taking, but also is misunderstands the action that they already themselves take as being far more virtuous for the climate than they actually are. So for instance, if you ask people, and there was a poll recently about this, you know, what are the actions you're doing to reduce emissions? Two of the top three actions are about recycling and using less packaging. Now, it's good. You should recycle. Great. You should use less packaging, but that's not going to solve the climate crisis. That is not the, ish the action that you need to take first. Uh, good for you if you do it. But it's not the action that you need to take first, second, or third if you're saying or if you think you're going to have an impact on the climate. So I think here we have an issue, which is this kind of information gap about what needs to be done and what policies to support versus a public that is, I think, more and more confused. And we see the result of it. The result we see in public policy is a retreat in some countries of measures that would be good for the climate or reduce emissions that are being kind of scaled back in the UK with the rollback of the net zero commitments in Germany with the watering down of the heat pump uh, legislation in France with a rethinking of the ban on combustion engines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the US, let's not forget where if a new administration comes in place that takes back some of the uh, fuel efficiency standards, although hopefully that's not going to happen anymore. So. There's always the sort of really uh, back and forth, and it's these days more back than forth. And I think part of the reason is that there is going to be a cost for the transition. That is true. And I think governments, public uh, opinion makers have yet to develop a language and a story, a narrative, a convincing narrative that the cost of the transition has to be sort of seen into a wider context where they're also far bigger opportunities to the transition. And if it's going to be a cost for you, you will be accompanied in that cost and in that transition. But we need to get to the other side of the of the river. And, and we're not really seeing that narrative being developed. Yes. And what I really find fascinating with what has happened with the IAA, uh, International Energy Agency, is that 
it has taken this kind of leadership role that was and it is still missing in in many different uh, many different ways because i was having the conversation recently uh, in italy about you know climate and energy poverty policies and really it's also something that that we notice uh, in this kind of sphere that there is a lack of understanding lack of leadership also coming from the governments uh, well Okay, the fact that there is a populist government in Italy is, of course, something that contributes to, to, to this lack of leadership. But I am utterly convinced that policymakers remain people who need to get educated on certain topics. So it's not because they get elected that they are totally omniscient and uh, they get a lot of power, but they are not omniscient. So it would be also really essential to to make sure that they understand really properly the topics. And that's where I think that the actions performed by the IEA and, you know, the kind of aura and charisma of, of Fatty Birol to, to, to share those insights has been extremely an extremely positive advancement in uh, in the past years. And uh, I hope to see that also at the COP in the coming weeks, uh, gathering so many different interests somehow, but also creating and shaping a narrative that somehow is less in the exclusion of pointing the finger and saying, you're bad, I'm good, because in many ways, uh, everybody will fly there. So everybody is bad in a certain way, but kind of uh, showing, demonstrating that everybody can be, become part of the solution and not of the problem. I think that's exactly right. So I'm going to take kind of the compliments and pass them on to, to the IA, to Fatih Birol. Um, I think he's played a really important role in shaping a narrative and putting it front and center about what needs to be done about the climate crisis. So just a side road before I kind of get to the heart of what the IA messaging is and just, you know, how we have tried and how they are advancing it. About half of the respondents in a recent poll by the IMF, when asked about the value of some climate policies, basically have no idea what the values are. So I think in the public discourse, and this was specifically about carbon pricing. So you're putting a price on emissions. Half of the response said, I, I don't know if that will you know, help or not. So the conclusion of this uh, report by the IMF was we need a lot more effort on public information about those policies that will help advance the solution. So I agree with your point. Policymakers are people after all. <laughs> and I think the public should really hold them to account on some policies that are not ideological policies. The problem we're seeing, unfortunately, because we're getting into a much more polarized world, is that irrespective of where we are, you mentioned Italy, but it's true in many European, most European countries, it's true in North America, and maybe in, in other countries, uh, it's true in uh, Argentina, where there are elections, it's true in, in other countries. You know, countries are divided along ideological uh, lines, regardless of facts. So, the climate issue is falling victim to that. And so again, this comes back to the issue of how do you engage and provide facts? This was something that the IA does uh, very well. Uh, we've, in recent years, put all of our analysis out for free, huge amount of data for free, huge amounts of, you know, here are the facts if you care to know. But I think that's not enough. That's a great step, but it's not enough. I think you also need to develop a narrative of you know, we're not doomed. You know, there is kind of, without being Pollyannish, there are good news. There is a good news issue here, stories. The transition is, I think the latest World Energy Outlook from the IEA came out a couple of weeks ago, you know, calling the transition unstoppable. This is the same agency you mentioned that was, you know, created in the 1970s to sort of provide stable and secure oil supplies. And here we're seeing that by 2030, we'll have 10 times as many electric vehicles on the roads and that half of the power supply will come from renewables. These are extraordinary figures. And so I think the message here has to be that we have made real progress on bending the curve of future emissions. We are going to see for the first time a reduction, a peak and a decline in the demand of coal, gas, oil, which have been very stubborn over the last many multiple decades and with very high market shares. And so we are making real progress and this is this needs to be celebrated. 
And we also need to acknowledge that despite the progress we've made, we are still far from being on track. But we need to acknowledge that these positive steps need to be reinforced, that progress is possible, that we should not be despairing. That's counterproductive because the messaging has to provide or the, the, the reality has to be acknowledged that, you know, we can still be in charge of our kind of future and our destinies. Because we are talking, you know, not about a very far off future. You know, I have kids and you started by saying, is like what got you into the climate stories? My children are 10 and 12. They will live to see the year 2100. You know, if you do a quick math and not great in math, but pretty sure that if you, if you look at average age ex, uh, life expectancies, you know, children born today will live to see 2100. We're not talking about future generations. We're talking about generation that is born today or, you know, this century. And so I think this kind of should really question us all and really prompt us to really consider beyond our differences. And there they exist. I, I, I don't want to minimize the fact that people have different, in many cases, legitimate differences about various ways. And, and, but there are facts and there are also uh, issues here that we are seeing the, the impacts and the effects of. This summer, this year, is going to be the hottest year on record. And it's not, it could be also, I mean, without being too kind of light about it, it could be that we're seeing in some ways some of the coldest summers of our lifetimes, if you look at it the other way, because we're going to see, continue to see temperature increases if we do not act. And, and here the imperative, if we want to have a shot at limiting temperature increases, the imperative here is to stop emitting carbon, period. I mean, there's no middle road here. We need to get to net zero by 2050 to have a shot to get to this uh, uh, temperature limits by the end of the century. If you had one magic wand that could kind of um, fix the situation, what, what would it be? That's a difficult question. <laughs> I believe, and maybe I'm kind of a little bit optimistic and I'll take it, that's fine. I do believe in the, in the power of information and in the power of facts. And I feel like if, if we spend enough time providing, and here I may be completely off the charts, but uh, providing the right information, the right way to tell this story, the right facts, the fact that we are seeing an incredible revolution in our energy system. And if we manage to tell this story, I'm hoping that this will change some of the perceptions that we're seeing. And we're focusing a lot on the negative perception. I mean, there are also a lot of positive perceptions on this, and I'm slightly not answering your question. You know, there is a, a lot of movement that is being made uh, on the, by the investment community, in corporations, by companies. Uh, this is not just a public policy area. This is not just a public opinion arena. This is also an economic uh, story. So there is, there is, you know, quite a lot that is already being made. And so, you know, my wish, uh, if, if I did have a magic wand, would be to sort of, for us to kind of pursue those objectives and pursue that road. And it's going to be a little bit complicated, given everything we talked about, about, you know, this polarization of the news and of the media, of where we get information, of how we teach our kids about all of these things and how they get their information that hopefully that that will help us kind of get to a slightly better place than we are today. So you've recently left uh, the IAA. So where are you bringing your hope and expectations? Uh, where would you like to bring your hope and expectations in the future? So it's, I kind of had a seven year run at the IAA, which I am extremely grateful for, where I had a lot of fun. We did a lot of things. I, I think this is an institution that is punching well above its weight and rightfully so. And I'm very proud that I contributed to its impact and its success. I'd like to move on in the same field, but in a place where I suppose I could have more impact. I think we need to kind of start of a place of what are the values that you want and espouse. And throughout my career in journalism, where I was driven by a very strong sense of kind of public mission, at the IA, where I was also trying to get the word out and, and reach as many people as possible, I think in the, the next phase, I would like to find ways to be in a place of impact and action. I feel like 
this is a time to kind of pull your sleeves up a bit and kind of get in there a bit more uh, directly. But I'll certainly keep an eye on what my colleagues are doing. I'll certainly keep an eye on where we're headed in this sort of public sphere. And I really think there are huge opportunities that our work is not done. Our work isn't even started uh, in this in this sense. And so this is where I'm going to try to find a role for myself. That's great. And um, let's uh, keep the conversation live. And I will be really happy to, to record a podcast in a couple of years about uh, your no new position and uh, <laughs> the impact that you that you do uh, out uh, out there. So thank you so much, Ted. Thank you very much for your time and for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Energetic. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into sustainability and the just energy transition with the most inspiring stakeholders. All links and resources are in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like this podcast, why not recommend it to a friend or a colleague? To continue the conversation, head on over to Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you for lending your ears. That's all for this episode. Until next time.